Good morning, everybody. Um, Kelsey's going to put up a couple slides for us. My name is Chris. I'll get into more introductions when I'm actually sharing my camera view. Um, but Kelsey is another educator who's helping me behind the scenes. Um, and we're just going to go over a couple of ground rules as we get started. But I'm so glad everybody could join us. And if you have a couple people um, watching, maybe one person could go grab a pencil and some paper or any kind of writing utensil and a scrap of paper, because a little bit into the webinar, we're going to be doing a drawing activity. So if you want to join in on that, no obligation. But if you want to, you might want um, a little bit of paper and something to draw with handy. So first, we're going to go over our community learning standards. Um, these are just our expectations to make this a great experience for everybody involved. Uh, so we're asking for you guys to pledge that I will be friendly and respectful of others in my interactions in the chat box. I will use the Q&A box for relevant and appropriate questions. So feel free to um, ask about any of the animals we're discussing today in that Q&A box. I will use the chat box to respond and interact in regards to the webinar topic. And I understand that if the moderator of the webinar has asked me to alter my behavior in the chat, I may be removed from the webinar. Um, so that speaks about some of the options in Zoom. If you haven't done much Zoom, uh, many Zoom webinars, you might not be familiar, but probably at the bottom of your screen, there are a couple options of things that you can click. One is chat and you can respond to some of my questions or make comments relevant to the webinar in there. And another one is Q&A. And sometimes people get them kind of confused. Um, Q&A is best if you have a question for me to answer about anything I brought up or any of the animals we're discussing. Um, I might answer some of those in the middle of the webinar, but I'll also hopefully have some time at the end to answer some of those questions. We may not get to them all if there are lots, but we'll tell you how to get questions answered even if they don't get answered in the webinar. Um, and then next we're going to go over, I actually covered a couple of these um, other housekeeping things. So, But first of all, speaking of that chat box, if you could share where you are from and how many people are watching. We're really curious to see um, where people are tuning into our webinars from. Um, we're coming from my home today, um, which is in Wildwood, Missouri. And we want to see where you guys are watching from and how many people we're reaching. Um, if you find the Q&A box, if you'd like to submit those questions, like I said, and I'll answer as many as we can. And we do have Kelsey, our tech person behind the scenes that will be helping out and monitoring the chat. So you may see answers to your questions from there or information from her. Um, she is a St. Louis Zoo educator as well, so you can trust her information there. She's an expert too. Um, and at the end, we will take a quick enjoyment poll and we thank you for your feedback on that. We always want to improve our programs and see how people are, um, what people are enjoying. So we ask you to take that poll at the end. And if you're a younger kid and you don't know how to do that, you can ask a grown up or an older sibling to help you out with that. All right. So you're going to go to seeing me, hopefully. Perfect. And I just, all right. I am actually going to share, well, let me introduce myself first. Sorry about that. I am Chris Bruno, one of the early childhood educators at the St. Louis Zoo. Um, and since we had Cinco de Mayo recently, um, I wanted to kind of focus on some animals of Mexico that we have at the St. Louis Zoo right now. Um, Cinco de Mayo, if you don't know, is a holiday that is celebrated in Mexico. If you know any Spanish counting um, number words, Cinco just means five and Mayo means May. So it's celebrated on the 5th of May um, in Mexico. And sometimes people in the US celebrate it as well, more as a way to kind of have tacos and fun things that they associate with Mexico. But it's a very different holiday in Mexico, but we're just using it as a reason to learn some more about animals from Mexico that we also have at the St. Louis Zoo. So first I'm going to share my screen and show you some information about Mexico. Get a little bit of a geography lesson in here today. So get this up full screen. Awesome. Okay, so first of all, bienvenidos al programa sobre los animales de Mexico. Um, so I'm learning to speak a little Spanish. I'm definitely still a bit of a beginner um, and still learning, but I've been have fun, having fun learning some animal of some Spanish. And that that I just said just means welcome to animals of Mexico. So that's what we're going to learn about today. 
So if you are from the United States, and it, from what I saw, it looks like everybody was tuning in from the United States, that is the part of the map next to this big yellow arrow. So Mexico, next to the red arrow, is our neighbor to the south. So we have a share a long border in the southern United States. Um, and they, like us, they have a lot of different um, environments or types of land and places um, where animals can live and plants can live and things like that. There's a lot of variety, just like in the United States. Um, so we're going to learn a little bit about those places and the habitats that they make for animals. So on the top left here um, of the screen, there is kind of a tropical forest environment or habitat. And if you haven't heard the word habitat before, if you've watched many of our webinars, you probably have, or if you love animals, maybe you already know this. But if you don't, a habitat is basically just a home, a place that has different space and maybe different weather and different plants. Um, and so all those differences make those places good for different kinds of animals. So we've got that tropical forest and the other habitat at the top is the ocean or the coastline and Mexico has a lot of coastline you may have noticed on that map. And then down at the bottom we have mountains and forests and then also more kind of rocky mountains and desert and uh, Mexico has more habitats and environments than just this. They have swamps and grasslands and places like that as well. So as we go through our animals today, you might want to think about which of the, we're actually, we're going to talk about which of these habitats uh, those animals tend to live in and why they work well for them. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're going to get to the animals. All right, so our first animal that we're going to learn about today is a big cat called a jaguar. And as we go through each of our animals, I am going to teach you an animal word in Spanish to go with each animal. So this looks like the blue is English and the green, if you can tell it's green on your screen, you might not be able to, is Spanish. Now these two words look the same. They have all the same letters, but they're actually said a little bit differently. And I apologize if my paper is moving a little bit. Uh, in English, it's pronounced jaguar. And in Spanish, it's jaguar because the J in Spanish kind of makes a ha huh sound like more like it, we would say an H. So jaguar or Hogwar. Let's say it together. Hogwar. Hogwar. It almost sounds like Hogwarts if you're a um, Harry Potter fan. So this is a picture of a jaguar from the St. Louis Zoo. Um, and this is also a jaguar, actually. It's just a black or melanistic jaguar. So wh which habitats do you think jaguars might live in? Oh, I gave you a hint by saying habitats. So if you want, you can put your guesses in the chat or just say it out loud to the room and I'll give you a second and then I'll tell you the answer. So basically anything that you might have guessed would be right, unless you guess the ocean because jaguars don't live in the ocean, although they actually are very good swimmers, unlike pet cats. But jaguars live in lots of different habitats. They live in swamps, in the mountains, in tropical forests. So they kind of grasslands, they live all over. Now, when you first looked at that jaguar picture, you might have noticed it's a big cat with spots, but there are lots of big cats with spots. So how do you tell the difference? I'll actually show you a picture of some of the other spotted big cats. This one is a leopard. And then this one is a cheetah. So how do we tell the difference between all those different kinds of spotted cats? Well, they actually have different kinds of spots. And before I show you the different spots, I actually want to get close up to that black jaguar again because it actually has spots too. I don't know if you can tell on the camera. I'm going to try to hold it really close. But in that black fur, if you look closely, you can actually see spots in there. So they're all spotted cats. And there are more spotted cats than just the ones I've shown you. But today I'm going to show you how to tell the differences between the patterns of those three kind of major types. So well, I'm going to go to share my screen and we're going to go to the whiteboard. This is where our drawing activity is going to begin. Um, actually, real quick before we draw, I'm going to look closely again at these pictures. So we'll start with a jaguar since that's our Mexican animal. If you look closely at its spots, you can see that it's kind of got circles with dots inside. So that's the jaguar spot pot pattern. And then the leopard, 
a little hard to see, but if you look at its side, it's got circles with no dots inside. It's kind of got a darker color inside the circle, but it's still a circle outline with no dots inside the circle. And the cheetah just has dots instead of circles. So we're gonna practice drawing those, and that's also gonna help us remember which is which. Because sometimes when you learn a fact, it's really helpful to, um, to do something to help you remember it. So hold on just a second. I actually have to fix my screen real quick. I apologize for the delay. All right, now we can go back and I can share it so that you can see the whiteboard and we're gonna draw those spots. I think we'll go in reverse order and we'll start with the simplest spots first. So for the cheetah, which was just those dots, you just kind of make little spots. You, if you have a thick marker or pen, you can just kind of dot it onto the paper or a bingo dauber, that would work too. So you just want to make little dots for the cheetah. Then we'll do the next simplest one, which is the leopard. And those are just kind of a circular shape. Sometimes we call those rosettes because actually, again, if you can make dots with your with just the tip of your marker or crayon or pencil, they actually, if you look closely at a picture of those leopards, sometimes they look kind of rounded edges, more like this. So it, it kind of looks like a flower, which is where it gets the rosette name. It's a little tricky for me to do on this whiteboard, but you get the idea. So those are leopard spots, and they are just empty in the center. And then if you want to draw jaguar spots, you do the same kind of circle, either out of dots or a line circle. And then you put some dots in the center, and it can be one dot or two dots or three dots. Oh my gosh, that looks a little bit like a surprised face. <laughs> ah, that's funny. Um, or you can do it kind of that rosette way with the spots around the, the little circle, circular dots around the outside. And I always do this. I don't make my one big enough. So this one's just gonna have to have one spot in the center. So that's how you make jaguar spots. So now you've learned how to tell those three big cats apart. And now we are gonna go back to my, back to seeing me again, and we're gonna talk about our next animal. So our next animal is a bird. So bird is blue in English, and the Spanish word is pajaro. Again, we've got that, that huh sound for the J, pajaro. You can try saying it with me, pajaro, and that means bird. And this particular bird is called a horned guan. Maybe you can guess how it got that name, the horned part anyway, guan. It's got this red horn in the middle of its head. To me, it looks a little bit like a unicorn. Um, I'm actually gonna turn this around so it's not quite so distracting. Um, but that's just a horn covered with red skin on the top of its head. And one of the cool things about the horned guans at the St. Louis Zoo um, is that they, have, we've been able to breed them or help them have babies. So scientists and researchers are learning more about those birds from that and how they can um, breed and have more birds because the horned guan, there actually aren't that many of them in the wild. So we're trying to help them and learn how to help them have more babies and be successful in the wild. Um, and in the wild, they live in those same kinds of tropical forests that we were talking about. Um, and one of the reasons there aren't that many of them is that some of those habitats are being destroyed for things like crops. So one way you and your family can help uh, birds like the horned guan is by choosing uh, bird friendly coffee. If anybody in your family drinks coffee, there are actually labels on some coffee that say bird friendly so that you can look for that because they grow the coffee without um, damaging the habitats where the birds live. And you can also look for our Rainforest Alliance products uh, because again, since they live in these tropical rainforests, um, if we're protecting those habitats, it will help those horned guans. So those are some things that you can do at home if you're able to, um, to help those horned guans and other species that live in that kind of habitat. So next we're gonna learn about another creature that lives in that sort of habitat and it is a monkey. So. The word monkey in English is mono in Spanish. You can try saying that one with me, mono, mono. 
So that is monkey in Spanish. And these are spider monkeys that we have at the St. Louis Zoo. And I want you to take a good look at this picture because I'm going to ask you a question about it with the tail. Um, take a peek at what's going on in that picture because we're going to talk about that in a minute. So again, those monkeys live in those tropical forests. And one of the coolest things I think about those monkeys is that as you can see in that picture I pointed out, their tails can grab onto things. It's called a prehensile tail, uh, which means they can use it almost like a hand. They can grab onto the rope like that. And they can also pick up something as tiny as a sunflower seed. Um, and did you see what else the, the spider monkey was holding onto in that picture? I don't know if you could tell what it is. You can guess in the chat if you want or just say it out loud. But it's a green bean. So that monkey was kind of taking its snack on the go. Um, so that's our spider monkey. That's another animal that comes from Mexico. All right. And our next animal, if I just flip my paper over. Our next animal is an amphibian. If you want to guess in the chat what an amphibian is, if you've ever heard of that kind of animal, it's different than a reptile or a mammal um, or a fish or a bird. So we're going to learn the word amphibian in Spanish. So it's a long word in English, amphibian, the tricky one. And in Spanish, it's anfibio. An, oops, I put my finger in front of it, fibio. Amphibio. You can say it with me. Amphibio. Awesome. You guys are learning some great new words. Uh, so amphibio is an amphibian and amphibians are like frogs and toads. They're animals that live or that need to kind of, they have special skin that usually needs to stay moist um, and they start their lives in the water. Some of them grow out of the water like frogs and toads and they spend some time on land. But this particular one, I should show you the picture a little closer again, is called a siren. And they stay in water all their lives. They keep their gills, which is this little roughly bit on their side, and that helps them breathe in the water. So obviously their habitat is in the water, lakes and streams they live in. And the cool thing about the sirens, we have these Western um, Less, Western lesser sirens, sorry, I almost forgot the name at the zoo, um, but sirens, I think, have a really cool origin of their name. So a siren is an imaginary creature. Um, these are real animals, but in um, stories, they're an imaginary creature that's kind of like a mermaid. They look kind of like mermaids. So I don't know if you could tell from that picture, if it continued, it would just go to a tail. There wouldn't be any other legs there, just these two at the front. So can you kind of see why it might be called something that is like a mermaid? Do you see the resemblance there? They have a body kind of like a mermaid. They have a head and arms kind of, those front legs, and a tail, but no back legs. So they're shaped kind of like a mermaid. That's how they got the siren name. The other thing I think that is cool about them is since they have to stay in the water to breathe, if it starts, if their pool starts to dry up where they live, especially in Mexico where it can be pretty hot and dry, um, they can burrow down into the mud to stay moist until the pond or stream fills back up again. Now, I don't know about you, maybe you like playing in the mud. Um, do you? You can answer in the chat if you'd like to. And we're gonna move on to our next creature. This one is a fish. So the English word is fish and the Spanish word is pez. That's a nice short one, huh? So let's say it together. Pez. Pez. All right, so fish is pez in Spanish. And you might not realize that this is a fish because it doesn't look exactly like we think most fish look like, but it is. It has fins and gills and it swims in the water. So what habitat would these guys be in that we talked about? And somebody said a stingray, that's right. That is the kind of fish that it is. It lives in the ocean, it's called a cow nose ray. Um, and we have them in our stingray deck at the zoo. And they, at least in the warmer months, um, they got their name from having that kind of bumpy flat nose that I guess is supposed to kind of look like the bumpy nostrils of a cow. Um, and one thing that I think is cool about them is they can kind of suck up uh, hard shelled creatures like lobsters and um, crabs and fish and they 
chew them up with these flat bony plates that they have for teeth, and then they spit out the hard shells. Uh, so they only swallow the soft bits. So it's kind of like if you ever eat um, watermelon in the summertime, you might chew up the soft bits and spit out the seeds. Uh, maybe this summer sometime you could get some watermelon and have a watermelon seed spitting contest. That's kind of a fun thing to do. But that's what they do with the crabs and the lobsters so that they don't have to eat all those tough, hard parts. Oh, somebody asked a question. Can they kill you? Um, so the ones that we have at the zoo definitely can't hurt you. Their barbs are clipped. It's kind of like clipping a fingernail. It doesn't hurt the animal. Um, but they do have that defense in the wild where they have those stingers on their tail. Um, but they really try to avoid people. That's kind of a last defense for them. So it's really unlikely that they would hurt you. Um, and even if they did, it might just hurt a little bit, but it, you know, probably wouldn't be too dangerous. But you do want to give them their space if you ever encounter encountered one in the wild, but the ones at the zoo are safe to touch, um, which is pretty cool. All right, so now we're going to move on to another animal. This one is a snake. So we're going to do the words first. Snake in English is, uh, this is a longer one, serpiente in Spanish. Serpiente. Serpiente. So that means snake. And take a good look at this picture, and I want you guys to guess what habitat you think this snake would be from. You can maybe kind of get some clues from its color. Where would it maybe blend in well? And what it's crawling on in this picture. Where do you think it might be from? And Kelsey is reminding everybody to put questions in the Q&A um, because we're more likely to see them there because there's a lot going on in the chat. Uh, sometimes I see them in the middle, but often I don't. So did you guess where the snake might be from? It's from the desert. That's its habitat. Oh, somebody said land. That's a good guess. And somebody guessed desert. Awesome. You were right in both, both regards. So this is a rosy boa because it's kind of got that pinkish kind of peachy color. And it blends in nicely with the rocks and the sand in the desert. And they've got some other cool defenses besides blending in. They can curl up into a ball to protect their bodies, but they can also let off a stinky smell from their tail to try to make the predators go away. Now, I bet you can think of another animal that lives near you if you live in the United States um, that you maybe you have smelled with that same kind of stinky defense. Any guesses? There's actually more than one, but the one that comes to my mind, yep, somebody said a skunk, definitely. So they have that same defense. All right, we are to our last animal, and it is a butterfly. So the English word is butterfly, and the Spanish word is mariposa. Mariposa. Let's see it with me. Mariposa. Awesome. Now maybe some of you know what kind of butterfly this is. It's a monarch butterfly and I picked them partly because they do spend some of their time in Mexico, but they are such an amazing butterfly. Um, I call them mighty monarchs because they are just super, super cool. Um, they don't spend all of their time in Mexico. I'm going to share my screen so we can learn some more about them. Um, they migrate. And if, we'll talk more about what migrating means. All right, so we're gonna go back to our map of Mexico once it loads, perfect. So you can see down here at the bottom of the map, here's our monarch. They spend their winters down in the mountains and uh, forests of Mexico because it's warmer there, like we talked about. Um, and insects do not usually like to be in the cold and butterflies need to be above about 50 degrees before they can fly and move around. So they spend their winters down in Mexico. And then when the weather starts to warm up, they fly all the way up to the United States. And then when the weather gets chilly again, more butterflies fly, monarch butterflies fly from the United States all the way back to Mexico. Um, and sometimes they have to fly as much as 3,000 miles, which sure sounds like a lot, but maybe you don't know exactly how much that is. Um, so I put some facts about how much is 3,000 miles on the screen here. So if you are from the St. Louis area and you drove to Disney World, you'd have to drive back to St. Louis and back to Disney World again before you'd have gone as far as these butterflies fly to get back to Mexico. 
Um, and they don't do it all in one day or anything, but that's how far they travel sometimes. It's also about as far as from New York City, which is kind of near the um, top right corner of the United States, all the way to Los Angeles, which is on the opposite side towards the bottom of the United States. It's a really long way. Or from St. Louis in kind of the middle of the United States, the Midwest, all the way to Alaska, which isn't even on this map, it's up above the top left corner. So that's how far those monarchs can travel, which I think is pretty amazing. The other amazing thing about monarchs and butterflies in general um, is how they have a, such a cool life cycle, they transform. And I probably should have asked this question before I showed you this slide, but I bet you knew anyway. What kind of creature turns into a butterfly? It's almost like two animals in one. Maybe you said a caterpillar, which is right, but that's only one of the stages uh, besides the adult of the butterfly. So it starts out as these tiny little eggs that the monarch butterflies lay on milkweed plants. And they only lay them on milkweed plants because once that little egg hatches into a caterpillar, it needs something to eat. And ca monarch caterpillars only eat milkweed. Can you imagine? I wonder what food you would pick if you only got to eat one food for that part of your life. Mm, I might pick ice cream or macaroni and cheese, I'm not sure. But I think it'd actually be hard to pick just one, but that's all that the, the monarch caterpillars need is everything they need is in that milkweed. So they definitely have to have that for their food. And then when they're ready for the next stage of their life, they become a pupa or chrysalis, like this green one hanging from the branch. And inside that pupa, they turn into an adult butterfly, and then they emerge and become an adult. And then the female butterflies end up laying more eggs, um, and the cycle starts all over again, which is why we call it a life cycle, because they keep going back through it. Um, so I think that's really an amazing transformation that those monarchs make. Um, and then now that was our last animal. So I'm going to stop the screen share and I'm going to take a peek at the Q&A to see if anybody had any questions I can answer. Oh, somebody asked, how does a butterfly multiply? Well, I kind of told you the adult butterflies, female butterflies lay those eggs and often they lay a lot of eggs. So it's not just one butterfly laying one egg and those um, butterflies hatch. Oh, I just realized, sorry about that, I forgot a screen. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen again. I totally forgot one other thing I needed to show you. Um, so let me go back, so sorry about that. Um, and because this is a way that we can help those butterflies, help them to lay their eggs um, and help the caterpillars have something to eat. I apologize, it doesn't want to load. I might have to stop and try again. Sorry about that. Let me try one more time real quick. And if it doesn't work, I'll just tell you about it. Oh, I think it's, okay, there we go. Let's try and see if it works this time. There we go, okay. So you can actually help butterflies by planting some of these plants. We talked about the milkweed, which is the pale pink one here, although it comes in other colors, because the caterpillars and the eggs need that plant. That's the only place that monarch butterflies lay their eggs and the, the caterpillars eat. But there are other plants that you can plant to help as well, like the aster, the purple one in the middle, because the butterflies use that for food, the nectar that they eat, and black-eyed Susans as well, the butterflies eat. And these are great plants for lots of other insects and pollinators too, not just butterflies. So you could plant those in your yard or your garden, or if you don't have a yard or garden, you could plant them in containers on your balcony or your patio. And if that's not a possibility for you, maybe you could see if your school could have a butterfly garden or a meadow, or maybe a park in your town could have some more plants for butterflies and other pollinators. So that's a way that you can help those creatures. Okay, now back to the questions. So sorry about that. So that's how the butterflies multiply. They need those places to be able to lay their eggs and for the, the caterpillars to eat. Um, and how do they turn into a butterfly in the cocoon? That's an awesome question. I actually don't really know the answer to that one. I think you'd need more of a scientist to answer that one. Um, but it's really kind of an amazing process and all butterflies do that. So it's 
it's quite an amazing transportation transformation sorry uh, how can you tell a boy and girl butterfly apart to be honest i don't know the answer to that either so that would be a great thing for you to research um, i'm not sure you can there are lots of animals that you can't tell just by looking at them which is a male and which is a female sometimes one is bigger than the other or they have different parts but a lot of animals you can't tell just by looking and somebody else asked why monarchs are orange um, that sometimes animals have bright colors to show that they might be um, kind of poisonous or taste yucky to predators so that they would avoid them. But I honestly don't know if that's true of monarchs. And how many colors can they come in? If you're talking about the monarchs, they only come in those colors. Um, and I think that's true of most butterflies, actually. They have their specific colors and patterns, and that's how we can tell different butterflies apart. I do know there is another butterfly that looks almost exactly like a monarch, um, and it's kind of a mimic of the monarch. And somebody said they love butterflies, which is awesome. I know I love butterflies too. It makes me so excited that it's springtime and we get to see them again. And somebody asked, can boy butterflies lay eggs? No, but it does take a boy butterfly and a girl butterfly to have the eggs. So we definitely need both, but the boys don't lay the eggs. Like in most animals, um, it takes the, the female butterfly to lay the eggs. All right, I think that was all of our, oh, there's one more question. Why are the spider monkeys called a spider monkey? That's a great question. You couldn't really tell. Let me see if I can get my picture out again from the picture, but they have really long arms and legs and that tail. And my guess is that that's why they're called spider monkeys is because they kind of have those long limbs and smaller bodies um, and they climb up trees. So they're good climbers like spiders. So that would be my guess as to why, but maybe you have an idea why you think they would be spider monkeys. All right, so our last thing, oh gosh, we kind of went over time, um, is we need to put up our enjoyment poll. So make sure that you take that. And if you did enjoy your, our program today, oh, two things. Once it's um, recorded, there will be a PDF of an activity you can do to practice your spot drawing. It looks like this. So check out that recording and you'll be able to download that activity if you enjoyed drawing the cat spots. Um, but also check out all of our other options. Um, we've got lots of things already recorded on the website. Um, just go to stlzoo.org and you'll be able to find all sorts of awesome activities and programs that can help you learn about more animals and have fun while you're at home. So definitely please join uh, that poll and make sure you hit submit, I believe, at the bottom to make sure your answer goes through. And if you have other questions, I, since we are, we've run out of time, you can always email animalquestions at stlzoo.org um, to get your questions answered. And they will probably be able to answer them better than I can because I'm still learning about a lot of these animals, so I don't always know the answers. But thank you guys so much for joining us today.